Hello viewers and welcome to this uh, special edition uh, of a program that uh, we offer for you on uh, QTV. My name is Babu Karsi and in this special edition uh, I am hosting members uh, from the Ministry of Health and uh, Ministry of uh, Gender, Children and Social Welfare. And the topic of discussion, of course, is centering on the COVID-19 sensitization and child protection related issues. I am Babu Karsi once again. Thank you so very much uh, for always sticking to uh, QTV. A reminder that we are from West Africa, the Gambia, broadcasting from our main studios along the uh, Kai River uh, Avenue Highway. And with me on this uh, special program, it's uh, Madam Harriet Bass, uh, from a child care officer, uh, Directorate of Children Affairs, uh, of course, from the Ministry of Gender, um, Children and Social Welfare. She is joined by Aisha Toba, also a social welfare officer from the same ministry. Uh, the only gentleman in the uh, studio is no other than Sajja Kamara, a mental health and psychosocial support officer from the Ministry of Health. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, special edition of the Will I write to say the Minister of Genders uh, have a special hour on QTV. Welcome once again. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Let me start with you. I want to be gender biased here. Sajja, I'll come <laughs> to you. But let me start with Harriet. Uh, very important. Uh, we are in COVID-19. No, we are not talking about that. We are even moving on. Uh, I hope it will end here. But um, the topic is very sensitive and uh, very important. We are talking about how to protect uh, our children, knowing that they are among the vulnerable people and uh, you've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes even before reaching at QTV. I understand you've made a lot of you know important work as far as protecting children is concerned you know in this uh, pandemic that we are fighting. Okay thank you so much uh, Babu Karsi. Like you said I am Harriet Bass from the Directorate of Children's Affairs. Uh, before coming to a QTV, like you rightly said, we've been doing a lot of community sensitization, both in the communities across the region and also even at the central level over here. Because we felt that during this pandemic, this is a crisis that the Gambia has never encountered. And then most of us here has never even witnessed oh, such type of a pandemic in uh, all our, our lives. So this has come into being because it's something new and we do not even know how it goes about. So therefore the protection of our children becomes very, very crucial because these are our future. These are our people that we rely upon to take up uh, the mentorship uh, roles that we, we are yearning for in our uh, old ages. They are going to take up all those roles. So it is important for them to be protected. It is important that we give them the chance for them to have a better future and a better life. So during the course of the COVID, we know uh, it's something new and then people are living at home which most people were not uh, living at home all the time with their families. Mm -hmm. But situations has forced so many family heads to stay uh, at home, not to go to work. So therefore, there might be a lot of social issues that would be happening. And therefore, we felt that we need to go out to the community and talk to people. So not only about going out to the community, talking to people, but also using the radios as well. So we've been going to the radios, talking to people as to how to protect themselves and also how to protect the children uh, who are also under their care because there are instances whereby you see children who are out in the streets they are not going to school because situation has forced them to stay at home and then uh, they have to stay at home and learn as well because at some point ministry of uh, basic and secondary education has put into some other new uh, mechanism not only about going to school uh, but you can also stay at home and also be learning yeah. as well through the inter internet and also through the the tv and also the radio as well so it should always be utilized at all costs so therefore we did not stop at that but we also partner with a lot of our partners because we know as the ministry responsible for issues of children you cannot do it alone mm. for the protection of children is everyone's concern and therefore we always involve our partners in whatever that we are doing and whenever we are doing our community sensitization like us the radio too we always involve our partners we even involve the CSOs like for instance we always involve ISRA we involve like CPA who are always the mouthpiece in most of the time the work that we are always doing mm. they can even go far as to where we do not even go and they always report to as well as to what they see on the ground that is going on so we've been doing a lot of this people may not know actually what we do but really the ministry has been doing a lot when it comes to the kickoff of the covid 
from uh, it, when it started in March last year, if I could remember fully well, mm -hmm. I think the Gambia recorded its first case in March 2020. So since at the time, we've been doing a lot of work in the protection of children. And then at some point, we realized that even parents, for them to even stay at home, they need the means, they need the money. Because imagine, uh, economically, you cannot take care of a family if you do not have the means. So therefore, we felt that they also have to be supported. They need maybe the basic needs that uh, is rice and some other uh, food stuff mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So we are able to partner with so many of our partners who were able to provide to us some of those food stuff and we are able to give to those vulnerable families. But we did not also just uh, give out, but we did an assessment to know who deserves it, who needs it at that particular moment so as to be given that food rationale that we have for them. Talking, talking about the uh, vulnerable uh, children here we are talking about, um, I'll come back to you Harriet, but I said to, uh, you'll agree with me that it's, it's an almighty, you know, difficult to fight in you know, issues like this, looking into the poverty rate of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, schools were stopped, I mean, take going back to last year, you know, kids were asked to stay home. Not all of them could access, you know, the learning on the internet, mm -hmm. you know, or access to TV. Mm -hmm. And forcing them to stay home was very difficult for some parents. And we saw a lot of kids outside. But how did this uh, campaign, you know, impact it on, you know, having to protect children from contracting the COVID-19? Okay. Um, we all know forcing someone to stay home is always difficult. So um, we had made effort. Uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and also the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education to go into the communities to talk to the families because we know how this lockdown has put an increase into the crime rate like sexual abuse cases in the homes, like uh, increase in the crime rate committed by children in the homes and then children begging in the streets. So we, we had uh, media sensitization programs targeting community radios as well as radios within the greater Banjul area to talk to families about some of these issues that may happen in the home and that are happening in the homes, to talk to them about how to protect those children because um, we cannot do it alone. They must support us. Children are at home. They are living with the families. So they need to support us in order to, you know, um, see how best to protect those children at home. It's true that the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education put up an initiative wherein children were learning um, on the TV and even the radios. But um, due to you know consultations, we realized that it was very difficult for some of these children living in hard to reach communities mm -hmm. to access this program because some may not even have the TV at home to learn. Some may not have that radio to learn. So that is why measures were made, uh, consultations were made to see if that can be changed in another way. That's why the schools were open and then children were asked to go to school. But then we know that it was like some will go from Monday to Wednesday yeah. and then the others will go in the other days. In all, to realize that social distancing at school in order to reduce the number of children that will be in school so that to have that space within the children um, in order to provide that access to learning for them because it was di uh, disturbing some of them at home. Mm -hmm. So these were some of the things, some, some of the measures that we are made. And then we had community sensitization programs. We went to the communities to talk to the families, to um, in inform them on how to protect some of these children not to you know, encounter um, um, some of these, you know, the um, issues that are happening, like adults taking advantage of children because they stay at home and they're idle at home. So it was well appreciated. We 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 saw, you know, the reaction from people. We heard from them. We heard from the communities, and they told us, you know, they they. There are certain things that we we discussed with them that they didn't know initially. So it was really helpful for for them in the protection of children in the uh, house. I, I will come back to the both of you. Your 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 work or your ministry uh, is just towards uh, protecting children, you know. And we've had in other countries where a lot of abuses, you know, mm -hmm. were registered, you know, thousands, you know, because people were locked down in their houses for mm -hmm. number of months that we are not used to, you know. But we will come to that later. Uh, let me turn to uh, Sajo. Um, um, 
the Ministry of Gender uh, cannot achieve some of the successes it, it, it achieved without the Ministry of Health. Yeah. I think uh, the, the, the busiest ministry so far, almost two years, is the Ministry of Health. And uh, we're in COVID era, we're in third wave, but take us through the journey, the work that you've been doing, particularly in collaboration with the Ministry of Gender in, in the protection of children. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. C. And thank you for having me. Uh, Good afternoon to the viewers. Um, but there are very many activities that we have conducted in collaboration with the Ministry of Gender, Children and Women and Social Welfare and other partner agencies like the UN and other CSOs, including Paradise Foundation and all. Overall, uh, the essence of the formation of the Psychosocial Support Subcommittee, wherein we have this connection with all of these bodies, is to um, uh, enlighten the populace, to sort of give information to the people, to making them understand what really is lacking in the understanding of circumstances surrounding COVID-19. You would know that COVID-19 is really a new thing that our bodies and everyone who is in existence today must um, uh, have never experienced it mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So when things occur as a new occurrences, they will cause fear, anxiety, and all of those overwhelming feelings to sort of calming the situation and the tension down because people really wouldn't be able to make decisions um, that will help them um, positively to change their life if they are in tension. So you would want to calm the tension to sort of making sure they are calmed down and then they can get a relaxed environment to think around what needs to work for them or what they can do to protect themselves and their kids as well. Our focus essentially goes more to kids because if you see children right now, they're pretty much vulnerable, like all the um, uh, earlier speakers talked about. You would see they lack some um, uh, ability to take in care of themselves. They depend on sort of the adults to provide for them for their living. So whatever thing that affects the adult community essentially will have to reflect on the kids, on the kids. also. Mm -hmm. So in that context, we cannot deal with them seldomly to separate them from the, uh, um, uh, from the relationship that they share with their parents and all of that. And that is why when we begin with our activities, we will go down to the communities together with them to sort of uh, give the information. COVID-19, how it started here in the Gambia. Of course, everyone is aware that COVID uh, started back in the 2019 in the world, but it just arrived here in, in March 2020. Since then, it has been taking a toll on our healthcare okay. and uh, everything in that regards of humanity. So yes, to, to sort of understand and give it back to the community, helps the community to be enlightened. That's basically what we've done, and to also talk with them from the grassroots level to understand what they need. Because before you can help someone, you need to understand the circumstance that the person is living in. Okay. We cannot really sit in here and ask people to buy a mask of $50 when we don't know the capacity of how much they can, mm -hmm. they can afford to buy such. So it was important that we go down to the people to, 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 to have in their understanding as far as COVID is, is, is concerned. So in connection to our relationship with other bodies, we were able to sort of um, uh, mobilize certain resources, including monetary funds and um, uh, basic equipment that people will require in their household to sustain themselves, including rice and all of those materials. Because some points you would see people then were not so much aware, so they could just go out on a test at the health facility because they manifest similar manifestations like when someone has COVID, they will tend to kind of isolate them and then t taking them under quarantine or test. That probably will take 10 days or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a family head who is taking care of the family, no one is there to support. If you should separate him from the family, it will be a very difficult time for the family. In so doing, then we, we had those um, uh, mobilization of funds in connection with philanthropies, other people who are interested in making people's life better to help them, to sort of give some people rights and um, money where required and the uh, basic equipment that will be necessary to take in care of someone in the protection of their hygiene means. Because you would see COVID-19 has much regards in connection to hygiene. Because generally, in fact, if someone is not hygienic, it will be difficult to maintain your health status. So COVID has really, it's difficult. It is taking uh, too much toll on our, on, our, on our mindset and everything. But it has also at least given some positive regards to understand that we need to maintain our hygiene status at least, to be in, in cognizance of what needs to be done to protect someone basically. You don't really need the big money to protect yourself when it comes to be clean or to stay healthy. You just need the basics in place, like to, to sort of 
not leaving kids wander around every community to bring in or pick some kind of infection from other communities to come. You will realize that when COVID started initially, because there was limitation in information, so people cannot tell who really is more susceptible to contracting the infection or not. And that was but going to be my next question. I'm sorry okay. to photocopy you short. <laughs> you know, uh, talking about, you know, we, don't, we don't know exactly who is, you know, who can contract this virus quickly or not. I've seen on two occasions on different places. I've that been to a hospital where I see someone with a child. He was wearing on a, he or she was wearing on a mask. a mask. The child was not with a mask. All right. I've seen in a vehicle where the police were trying to enforce the fa face mask. You know, he was with a mask. The kid was not with a mask. I was like, okay, so uh, are children okay that you know they're exempted from COVID or not? I think that's also very important when it comes to the protection of children. Pretty much. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to healthcare, for every disease pattern, of course there are diseases that will occur in all age groups, being it a children, being it adult. But of course there are other diseases also that will affect children, but wouldn't essentially affect adults. So in the context of COVID-19 when it started, because no one fully understand what is happening, and people who are being disturbed more by COVID infection was much related to adults. So the focus was on adults to protect them because kids were not seen to manifest all of those manifestations that are coming out from adults. Mm -hmm. So it was similarly assimilated as to this is an adult type mm -hmm. of a problem okay. then. Okay. But because viral diseases are so difficult to handle, so very crazy, mm -hmm. so to say, um, but they keep changing. As far as you try to make mechanisms to protect yourself, they will adapt to it and they will change that's what is called a variant, to mutation, to change their characteristics. And when they come in this time, even if you had gotten a medication that was working previously for the other type, the new characteristics that are built in the new one might not be able to be controlled by the other medication that you had previously. So of course, when they change also, because they have all of those new features in them, that could be affecting the kids, as opposed to when the viral diseases occurred previous, because the new features were in there then. So the understanding was kids were not so much affected. So, and also for a kid to take care of themselves, it need time for you to teach them, sort of. Um, but to maybe um, but make a kid to understand how to put on a mask and uh, how long would you take to change a mask or how to protect the mask from being dirty or contracting from somewhere would take much more time as compared to if you had to talk to an adult. So you would want to basically making sure the adult population understand what needs to be done because I can't teach my child at the house of something that I have no knowledge about. Everything I would be able to teach anyone would be something I understand. understand. Otherwise, I would just be faking the situation, which really wouldn't work in the context of COVID. Mm -hmm. So we've seen now with the new coming of the Delta variant, some kids have been affected, some are under admission. You will go to sanitarium, you can have kids from seven to 12 years of age. You go to Amba, Amba, them and clean the same way. So yes, purposely we could say um, uh, COVID the variant right now could be affecting kids as much as it affects the adults. But yes, this has to be limited because the informations are in confirmed. That's why you would see new trends of information will be flowing all the time. Okay, yeah. uh, Mr. Yeah. Kamara, I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to rest and turn uh, uh, back to my uh, ladies. Uh, Harriet, I'll be back to you. you. We are talking about how to protect these children in these difficult times that we are uh, with COVID. Uh, you are not only partnering with the Ministry of Health, but other you know, partner ministries as well, justice, you know, the list goes on. Um, there were a lot of abuses that you know, had occurred in, in other countries. Were there any in the, con in the Gambia? Uh, of course, yes. We also realized during the course of this COVID pandemic, there were a lot of uh, abuses that were happening to our children, like sexual abuse was as an increase because it's a situation, like I said earlier, that has to force people to stay in, 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 inside. Mm. It, uh, at the first time, it was wherein people have to be indoors because there was limited information that people don't have to go out. So the information, like Sajja said, was not well understood mm. at the time. So you will realize people were not moving. At some point, you go out to the street as if people were not around. Mm. But people were limited to the information that, that we are receiving and then people were kept inside their homes. So because people were not used to that situation, it will force a lot of social issues to happen. And then you have the sexual violence that were happening to our children. Some were even as young as one year. Some were being sexually abused. It's so sad that sometimes when you talk about all these sexual abuses that are happening to children, people think you are just talking out of 
your, your whatever or you are just cooking mm, the trying stories. to make up stories mm, no yeah. we are not making up stories mm. this was a time whereby so much of our girls were being caught and then we all know that fgn is banned in this country mm. but this was a time that people take us to be an uh, an opportunity, opportunity. to mm. cut the girls it was a time that parents uh, feel that uh, i can get her off to marry when she's below the age of 18 the Children's Act is in amended in 2016 and says the legal age for marriage is now 18 years. Mm -hmm. No boy or a girl should be married of between this uh, l before the age of 18. But our girls at the time we have been married of, and they were not also just been married of or been caught, but they were in the street selling, mm -hmm. somewhere in the market selling maxes. I've seen a lot of that. A child mm -hmm. can help the parent to learn some of these our domestic jobs, but not hazardous work that will put our children into situations. The risks, yeah. You don't give your child like a plate of banana to go and sell on the street. Mm -hmm. The street is where you will meet up with a lot of people. And this child is a child and then not to be blamed. And then is a child that does not well understand what he or she to, should do. I am using he or she because all this uh, violence can equally happen to a boy, boy and equally happen mm. to a girl. Mm. So we are not only focusing uh, on, on the girl child, but we are looking at them equally. Because what can happen to a boy can equally happen to a girl. Mm. I think you could remember mm. there was mm. some time where an 11 years old boy, boy. was being raped. Mm. So all those things are happening in our country. There was a time, in fact, in this country, could you imagine that a nine months old baby was being raped? This is just nine months old. Mm. Imagine how and what on earth would have moved this individual to have to rape this child? But these are realities that are happening. So we ought to be very vigilant. And that's why we, we do not even stop with whatever we are doing. We always continue having a lot of community sensitization. We need to meet people in their bantabas. We need to go out to the communities. It's not only about going to the region, but also at the central level. So many things are happening. Not only about these violences that are happening to children, but we realize there are situations wherein our children are even involved in, uh, in conflict with the law. So when they are in conflict with the law, of course we have the children's court. In fact, that, that was going to be my next question about the issue of a lot of youngsters <clears throat> at the less than 18 being, you know, caught doing something illegal. They will be arrested, taken to the courts and later to the juvenile prisons. There was a time that, you know, the juvenile was almost filled to capacity. So during COVID, I was like, wow, are they all going to be packed that way? What, what, what step did you take in that situation? Like that? The legal age of criminal responsibility in the Gambia, it's 12. So once you clock the age of 12 and you commit an offense, you'll be held responsible for the offense that you've committed. And then the matter will be taken to the children's court, wherein there is a social worker from the Department of Social Welfare. You also have the magistrate who are there, but the court will be in camera. So they will listen to what the child has to say and also those that are within uh, uh, at, at the court set up at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. So they will listen to what the child is to say. So if there is no other means that this child has to be kept somewhere to, for him to be reformed, for him to understand that what he has done is wrong, so the only thing that the magistrate can do at that particular moment is to ensure that this boy or this girl is being kept at one place. And then for the boys, we have the juvenile wing, which is an old juice one. At some point, it was overcrowded. Mm -hmm. Not to that extent like that of mile two, if I say overcrowded, mm -hmm. but the number of people that were at the juvenile wing was so much. And then because people said the COVID, you don't have to be uh, uh, like more than so much uh, a number of people in a particular uh, uh, space. Mm -hmm. So we have to partner with the Ministry of Justice, with the Gambia Bar Association and some of these uh, NGO partners mm -hmm. and our CSOs as well. So when we meet with them, we have to negotiate over this issue and the judiciary as well. So when we discuss with them, we were able to reach a compromise that uh, more than 20 of the juveniles who were there at the time, they were granted bail because uh, to avoid the congestion mm, of the prison. Overcrowding. So mm. yes, so they do not fit in there at that particular moment because there are some that have uh, committed crimes that you can just negotiate over it and they can be granted bail. So they were able to be granted bail and they were let out and then the social worker was also continuing to work with them and also work with their families because there is no child who is on the street who does not have a family. All of these children that we see on the street, obviously they are from families, but also most of our problems that we see in this country is because of uh, parenting. Parenting is still a problem. 
You don't have to pet a child to an extent that you are even uh, doing more harm than good to the child. Mm -hmm. Whatever we are doing as an estate should be to the interest of the child. And whatever that you are also doing as a parent should also be to the interest of the child. We need to train our children. We need to tell them about responsibility. It's not only about right. A child equally has a right and also has a responsibility. So the child needs to understand this from a very early stage of his or her life. Because if the child does not understand this, the child is left out on his or her own. He goes out to the streets, comes back maybe with money, or if not with money, he comes back and starts uh, talking anyhow to parents. Those are not things that as in an African, as in a Gambian, you are supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. As a Gambian child, you are supposed to know what, what are some of your limitations. You are supposed to inculcate to the mind of the child as to issues of respect and our cultures as well. So these are some of the things that di differs us from other parts of the world. Some people may be saying issues of child right is a Western thing. Child's right is never a Western thing. The Western have their own culture as to their upbring uh, upbringing of their children. We as in Gambians, we ha also have our own cultural setup as to the way we bring up our children. Back in the days, how do, we, uh, how do we train our children? It's the community coming up together to ensure that we train our children in the way and manner in which we want to inculcate dis discipline into them. But now, a child is of industry. I see Sajo's son and he is with a cigarette smoking. Even if I stop him and come and tell Sajo, Sajo would be like, why do you have to say that to my child? Yes, he has a right, but what he is doing, it's going to harm him. So he needs to be talked to about that. And then we as in parents, you don't only tell a child, stop this, it's bad. Tell the child what you are doing, it's not good for you. And then why is it not good for the child? Explain all those things to the children. We don't have to leave our children to their own liberty. If we are to leave our children to whatever that they feel like doing, we will end up bearing the consequences. That's and true. these are not situations that we have to live in as in a retiring parents and retiring good citizens of this country. Particularly during this uh, time of COVID-19. Uh, Isatu, um, you've talked about going to the grassroots, uh, meeting people at the hinterland, you know, going to communities and organizations or meeting them at Bantabas. Mm -hmm. um, what has been the response like? Because um, Harriet have talked about, you know, kids selling banana on the street and stuff. Sometimes it's difficult to, you know, stop you know, uh, this from happening because of the poverty rate, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. But what has been the response from these families, particularly, you know, in the up country where, you know, we all know what we are opportune to have from the Congo, sometimes it's difficult to have down there. Mm -hmm. Has the response been positive or negative? Um, most of the response that we have is um, like what Harriet has been emphasizing on, mm. that is parenting. Parenting is cross-cutting is in the regions and even over here. So the problem is parents are like too busy, I can see now, than um, taking care of their children and then letting the children know their responsibilities towards their communities, towards their parents, towards the elders in the communities. So um, these are some of the issues that came out and um, they, they were um, emphasizing on the government, the government, what can the government do to support? Because most of the time they would say, if I send my child to the school, it is the responsibility of the school to inculcate the knowledge into the child and also, you know, discipline the child, which is not most time the case. It is the responsibility of the school. But then the child spends more time with the parents at home mm. most of the Than time. School hours, yeah. So the parents also should come in and support. Most of the comments that came out, some of the parents were saying that um, um, parents are too negligent and then now parents wouldn't want others to discipline their children like it was happening before. So we can say people are now being, you know, kind of confused, sorry to say, mm -hmm. as to the, um, the parenting that was happening, the parenting style that was happening, and then the modern parenting style that has been happening. Mm -hmm. So in communities, you know, people are, you know, busy with their community work, uh, women going to their women cafes, going to their um, tekladulas, as the Mandinka says, mm -hmm. Mandinka say, going to the farm, and then leaving the children at home, which is not the case. So children are more vulnerable 
to abuses happening in the home. And some were talking about the lockdown that happened, that uh, parents are forced to stay at home, not going to work. But then that is why the ministry came up with the support program, giving food provision to families in order for them to you know, help the family at home and not send their children to go out selling or to, you know, um, take the excuse of I'm not working and, you know, it's going to create a lot of psychological effect. So it's a big problem that was happening all over and then um, people, you know, that those, those were the responses that people were making. Mm -hmm. So we all know it is always difficult to force someone to stay home, to force someone to stay home and then not providing financial support to the family as before. So it has the psychological effect. So that is why going out to the community to talk, this, to, talk to these people was really, really helpful. And during the radio programs, we had so many calls from community members emphasizing on all these issues that we have mentioned. And they, they, were re uh, they, they really understand the issues and they are ready to you know, come up and see how best to um, make such changes in the community. That, that, that's encouraging. Harriet, let me come back to you before moving to Sajo. With the issue of, you know, um, setting up examples, uh, there are laws, as you rightly mentioned, that uh, protect children, and when you do that against them, the laws will take its course. During this uh, time of COVID, you know, were there any, you know, legal actions taken against people that we have found wanting of abusing or violating children? Yeah, during the peak of COVID, the courts were not also in operation that, at the that, time exactly. for, for a period of time. Mm -hmm. But after which they've also st uh, started uh, uh, operating and they were hearing all these cases that we have brought to their notice at the time. Because all this cannot be done in the absence of the other partners. We also need the police as well because the police has the mandate to do the investigation. And then we will just provide the care and support. If there is a need wherein the child has to be withdrawn from the home, we have a temporal shelter where the child would be staying for the time being. There are social workers that the child will be living with at the time. And then to be providing psychosocial support okay. as well as working with the Ministry of Health as well. So we cannot do this in the absence of the other uh, sector as well, even with the Ministry of Justice. Even for us, at some point, we have cases wherein we need to write to the Ministry of Justice for them to give us as to what is their take over this whole mm -hmm. matter. If there is a need wherein mm -hmm. we should have a case conference, we call some of our few partners that we feel they have a say over that case, and then we call in for a case conference, and then we discuss over that matter that is uh, co currently happening, so as to see if we can have durable solution to that particular case. But we, we do, the court is still in operation, and right now we have uh, the children's court here in uh, in, in Canifin. Canifin yeah. No, it's in Koto now. Okay. We also have in Birkama, we have a functional one too in Basse. So all this is geared towards ensuring that uh, perpetrators are brought to book so they can also be had if there is no other means but for them to be uh, kept at one place for the time being, for the safety of the individual and also for the society, then that would be done. But all is left with the discretion of the magistrate at the court because they are oper operating uh, independently, but we work uh, in partnership with them. Mm. Interesting. Uh, Sayo, I will come back to you. Uh, you work with the Ministry of Health and uh, we're talking about how to protect these children we, you know, within the space of COVID. And recently, I visited uh, one of the clinics that is in Demban, where COVID-19 patients that were under serious conditions were kept, you know, which 90% of them are, you know, supported with oxygen, you know, to, to breathe. And I saw, you know, young children there, you know, who were really, really, you know, suffering, you know, because of COVID. So I said to myself, wow, I was thinking, you know, COVID is only for the elderly, you know, but now it has torn out the other way around. So I think it's also very important for parents to definitely know that the, the new variant or the start wave, you know, doesn't discriminate whether you're a child or you're an adult, you know, it's, it's for everybody and people should definitely protect children. Yeah, very well. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, the changing of virus mutation variant would remember, make it difficult for the handling of the variant. And um, uh, you would realize earlier because uh, all of us talked about this because there wasn't much understanding into COVID-19 when it started initially. Mm -hmm. 
So one wasn't able to tell whether children really are susceptible to contracting the infection at a rate at which the adults have been affected equally. Mm. So, but then people who have been affected were the adult class of people, 18 years and up. So it was safe then to say kids were not affected because there wasn't any data or evidence to say mm. really they are. Until there's evidence, you cannot be sure to say something. Mm. But uh, with the changing effects of the uh, variant, the Delta variant, we've seen um, uh, very many number of kids that have been affected with this infection. Of course, uh, the severity level at which it affects an adult who has underlying health conditions condition, yeah. mm -hmm. when it comes to kids. Mm. It's, it's also safe to say kids who are under five and down are building up their immunity. Should this virus be affecting them, we would expect that the severity level will be more intense in them because they are developing. They didn't have that strong immunity. Mm. And that is in the same context why we tend to protect elderly people, people we regard as to be an elder. Mm. Because really, aging is a disease process of its own because it compromises every aspect of your well-being mm. and your health status. Your immunity will be down. And in the relation to COVID-19, the, the center of the whole issue is in context to the immunity. Mm. That is why there is this promotion of encouraging people to take the, 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 the vaccine. vaccine. The vaccine essentially may not have to protect you from contracting the infection right now because the virus is changing. But what mm. is so to say is, as you are vaccinated, you stand a more better chance uh, uh, to not be um, uh, severely... Okay, I, I, I will have to come back to you, uh, Sanjo. I'm sorry, so, sorry about that. Um, uh, but Harriet, here we are. Um, you've been doing it at the grassroots level. If you've reached the peak. I mean, you're at the television level now. People watching will be like, okay, what should we do now with these kids? Um, thank God schools are closing down. You know, we're expecting children to still stay home. You know, perhaps the only thing that can take them out right now will be studies, you know, to come, which is not every day or around, around the week. You know, what do you think is best in protecting these children now that schools are closed down? But, you know, the new variant is here and it seems like getting, you know, I can see the cases are getting increased every time and even now and then, and everybody is at risk, not only the old elderly people, but even young children. What should we do as parents at the home with children? Uh, Baukat say, I think we should never relent in whatever that we are doing with our children. Mm -hmm. And that is why we are able to have community child protection committees across the country. Mm -hmm. So these community child protection committees, they comprise of religious leaders, the security, the child, a child rep, him or herself, to be in that committee. Mm -hmm. We also have different people from among uh, the, the community setup, depending on the community setup that they have. So what we do, we just support them because they live in their communities. They know what is happening in their communities. They know their community best than we do. So we also give them a lot of trainings, most especially during this period that children are at home. Studies and normal school hours, they are different. These are times we are in, as in a parent, you need to be very vigilant. A child can leave your home going to school, and then along the line, a heavy rain occurs. It will be difficult, probably, for the child to find his or her way. Maybe there are gutters that are not even covered. I think you could remember there was a time we are in, there was a child that fell into a gutter, and that was the end of that uh, particular child's life. Mm. So we need to be vigilant. We always talk to this, our CCPs is to always encourage dialogue among parents and their children. We can always address this, our problems as the protection of our children, if we entertain dialogue among parents and children. Mm -hmm. Let's dialogue. Let's talk about realities in life. Things are happening to other people's children. It could equally happen to you. Mm -hmm. But we need to be vigilant. We need to be very much so that what is happening uh, in reality, it's really the fact. Mm. So it's not about having a TV channel and then you leave the child to be watching TV throughout the whole day without doing anything. No, that's not it. It's not about parenting. We need to talk. What is right is right. You compliment the individual for doing such type of a good job. But what is wrong? Stop the individual from what he or she has done. And then children go for studies. Sometimes they can leave the home, but they do not return home as to the actual time that they, they are supposed to be at home. So you ask them. There is nothing wrong in a parent and, uh, and his or her child to always have a dialogue to talk about issues, even about issues of your menstrual cycle, because this is where the stage of this individual, the girl child, starts to change. 
and start seeing things that he, uh, see has not been seen or even been known for. So life start, can even start from there. And also as in parent, let's not just have the feeling because this person is a child, does not even take note as of what I am doing. Children are very, very smart. And they easily take note and their records are very, very good. They can serve them for years and years. So whatever you do to a child today can harm you in the near future. So let's collectively come together as in parents, as in community members, for the interest of our children. Let's work to, uh, towards their well-being and ensure that they are protected. Mm -hmm. Let's not give them the opportunity wherein they will be involved in crimes, they will be involved in drugs. I think there was a time in this country that when it's seven or around eight, everybody has this fear. That I, if it, I, I should go on my normal errands, but I cannot go because the streets are not safe. And then those that are involved in all this uh, illegal act, most of them are even our children. So we need to talk to them about all of this use of drugs, all of these crimes that they are involving themselves to. And sometimes it's we the adults that give them all those chance. I am an adult, I'm involved in drug peddling, and I am also involved in a minor. Mm. Because you know, the, when it comes to uh, the, the court, the privilege that the child will have, I may not have it. At some point, you will see adults that will leave the responsibility with the child. And because the child does not understand issues very well, the child will also take up the responsibility as, I am the one that does it. But when actually the child did not do it, the child is acting under the commands of an adult. So we need to be very vigilant and also know those that our children are also moving with. Some adults are using our children in different ways, but we are not noticing them. And sometimes even we as in adults, because we want to be free. We want to get our children out of us. As you are coming into the house, you are noticing your presence that I am tired and I don't want to be disturbed. If your child does not make fun of you and disturb you, who will your child be making fun with? It's going to be different. So children sometimes when they do not have the company and feel comfortable to express themselves with their parents, they look for it outside. And you can never tell who they are going to associate themselves with. Let's not give the children that liberty. You give your child a plate of banana, a plate of roasted groundnuts to go and sell. Your child, you are exposing her or him to the streets. In the street, he or she can meet up with different people. Someone will say, I will buy you and buy the plate. The child does not understand. Some children, yes, they are very smart. But some are not yet even up to that maturity level. They don't understand issues. And they don't understand where this individual is coming from. Mm -hmm. So all this is as a result of we not giving time to our children. Let's give them time. They need our time. All that we do, it's for them. That's true. That's true. Uh, all that we do is for, for them, definitely. Uh, let me come back to you, uh, Saji. We were on a very important point, uh, yeah, yeah. Ali, on the issue of the, the, the new variant that, you know, is, that doesn't spare anybody. And um, what should we do to protect these children? And recently, we've seen some children being admitted at the hospital because of COVID, which was not the case at the beginning. Uh, so, as I rightly mentioned, it's like there's a little, you know, twist with, with the way things are going. You know, we're in a stage that nobody is safe as far as the COVID is concerned. Oh, pretty much. In, in that context, and that is why the Ministry of Health have taken this responsibility solely and boldly to kind of sensitize the populace to giving out information as to how well the vaccines could help our population. Um, but you would realize that kids from days under 18 are not given the chance to be vaccinated. Of course, they are getting infected with the COVID. But the death rate at which people are dying is more, is more occurring in the adult age group, mm -hmm. uh, about 30 to 60 age group of people mm -hmm. as opposed to the young. Mm -hmm. So because this is so, and that because we do not have capacity to extend to everyone, and there is no certain thing to say or evidence as to the safety of the vaccination to kids. It's safe to give to the adults to protect them, kind of. And then meanwhile, we build on to protect our kids. Basically, what we need to do for children, including everyone in the society, stays the same. That is to maintain our hygiene status, to kind of do away with crowds where possible. If you do not really need to be in crowd, there's a difference to understand the need to be and the want to be. If you just want to be in a crowd, it's not a room for you to be in now because of the COVID. But if you really do need to be, you can put on the precautionary measures as to putting on the, the, the mask, even if you are vaccinated. 
because we've seen people who have been vaccinated and are contracting the virus. But that was going to be my next question. Oh, I always lead you. I don't know. Really? It's great that we understand the vaccination. The essence is not really to protect anyone from contracting the virus. So far now, initially it was because that's what the vaccines will do essentially. But now that there's this change in patterns, it's been realized that people who have been vaccinated do not get the severity of the disease. The as opposed to, yes, severity, that is the difference. Mm -hmm. You can equally get infected. Both of us can be infected, but uh, maybe the one that is not uh, vaccinated mm -hmm. will get to a more intense severity level as needing the oxygen therapy or taken for admission. Someone who has been vaccinated could be positive of test and then still can sleep in the house. You just need to protect the other people that you associate so that you don't spread the virus yeah, to the larger community. That is the main essence that people need to understand. But because you get vaccinated and then you contract the virus, it's not a room to say the vaccine is not doing any well. It's, it's, it's just the changing situation that we, we, we're seeing ourselves in. We really do not understand what is happening. But what is understood at any time is communicated to the populace so that there is this trust between the healthcare service providers and the community at large. Because uh, until we gain their trust and until they think we're working for them in their best interest, whatever we bring in wouldn't be sufficient to take care of them because they wouldn't be listening. And if someone doesn't listen to your, your explanation of whatever thing, it's not understood. So there's no way they're going to be protected if there's no this tr trusting relationship between us and our people. Well, uh, we're running out of time, uh, but I said I will just say as uh, members from the Ministry of uh, Gender, uh, Children and Social Welfare, the message to our parents um, or guidance, we're in holiday mood, uh, schools are almost closing down, if not already, you know, in, sometimes it's difficult to say, you know what, Ben Halibum Gena, you know, don't go and sell mm. or whatever. But you know, the risk right now is high, and I think parents should definitely understand that. Because that kid that you are sending out there to go and sell that banana or that jerta saf, mm -hmm. you know, when he or she contracts the COVID, you know, you might end up spending more, you know, waste of resources, energy, time, you know, and putting the whole family at risk. Mm -hmm. You know, so protecting them at this time is very important. Mm -hmm. My, the, the message to parents will be for them to be vigilant about the children mm -hmm. and also contribute in protecting the children in the homes. Let them observe the situation of the, ho um, the children in the homes and also dialogue with the children to understand their issues and know how best to help them instead of allowing them to go outside, consult other people who may give them advice that may, be, may not be in their best interest. To allow the children to go to school but also monitor they are going and they are coming. If it's time to come back home, let them find out. If the child is not home, let them find out from the school, find out from the teachers, find out from the friends what has kept that child um, until after school hours and after some time without coming home. Let them not um, involve children in selling in the streets, not exploit these children, giving them work that they may not be able to handle, which may disturb um, their health, which may disturb their physical well-being, and also their mental well-being mm. um, um, in regards to their participation and interaction with others. Let the parents help us contribute in protecting these children um, to ensure that um, children are safe because they are going to be the adults tomorrow. They are going to take up that responsibility to also, you know, uh, be in that future generation that is coming. So they, they, their support is really needed. Mm -hmm. They understand their children better, so it is important for them to contribute in that aspect. Mm. Finally, Harriet, um, COVID doesn't discriminate and children need to be protected, I guess you will agree. Of, of course, yes. Mm. So uh, just to say uh, there is something that I forgot to mention as to our ministry's intervention during the course of the COVID. We've also worked with uh, institutions that work uh, operate residential care homes like the SOS mm. to see what is their level of preparedness mm. for the COVID and then during the course of the COVID, how are the children being protected who are currently under their custody mm. as well as our own shelter for children which is in Bakote. It's a temporal home but we have children who live there and we have mothers who care for them too. Mm -hmm. So we also visit them to see their level of preparedness as well as penny appeal. They also operate a, 
a home where children are, and then a hard house in Sencho, Sencho Orphan Age, and also a, a second home foundation around Kololi. We also visited all this place because it's our mandate as the state, and we ought to do it. Because they would all, in one way or the other, say we fail in our duties. Mm -hmm. We cannot do it all, but at least we've done at least what we are supposed to do at the time. And then we are still continue to do it. Because this work, you can never have an end to it. Mm -hmm. The more you do, the more diverse it becomes, and the more dynamics it becomes. So we will always continue to do more of it. We will maybe continue to do more of this uh, community sensitization. We will increase and reach to uh, communities wherein it's hard for people to know about all these issues. Because for some people, this is a child never has a right. Mm -hmm. But forgetting that, you give a child a name. That alone is, uh, is, is, is a right of a child that you've given. Taking the child to the hospital for a uh, monthly uh, vaccine or whatever that has to be done on the child, the monthly checkup that they take to the children, all those things are geared towards protection of the child because the child is very, very vulnerable from zero to five. So we all do this and encourage parents to do more of it as well as the community, like I said, the CCPC, they serve as our mouthpiece in the communities mm -hmm. because they live with the people in their communities. Even we are in something, it's uh, uh, happening in their community, we urge them to report, which we always tell them they can equally report to the police, they can equally report to their local authorities at their level, they can also report to our regional officers because across the country we have our regional structures that are in operations and they can always report to them as to all these things that are happening. But still there is a gap and then we need to work together as in partners in development, in ensuring Ta that... Talking about partners, I'm sorry you couldn't have, you couldn't have done this alone. Do you have outside and partners that support us? Yeah, like this program mm. is being sponsored by UNICEF The Gambia. Okay. They are very key when it comes to issues of children, children and so they will mm. never stop in whatever they are doing. Even the moment they see something is happening or about to happen, mm. or the moment they get the information, they will always contact the ministry as to something is happening. Are you aware of it? If you are aware of it, what step have you done? So we have a close relationship with them and that is why they felt that we need to come out to the TV, not about going to the community only, but also coming to the, to the TV and talk to the people as well so people can hear. It's not about uh, the region. We have so many issues that are happening here in Combos yeah, yeah. that are not necessarily happening in, in up country. Mm. Like uh, so many things of even the sexual and gender based mm. violence that are happening. We may have even more of it in the Combos here than even in the yeah, rural exactly. Gambia. Mm -hmm. In the rural Gambia, for some, it's like they do not just have uh, the understanding. Mm. But once you give them the information, it's okay mm. with them. So those are some of the things that we realize. But we can only do it with our partners. We also have our NGOs that we have. Uh, a mutual relationship between us and them and then we have our steering committee meetings that we have uh, uh, every quarter of the year to ensure that our children are protected and then if there is a gap then a flag will be raised to say something is not happening well and then what would you do as in a ministry mm -hmm. because we are the chairs of that uh, steering committee meeting so it's our responsibility to ensure that things are happening mm -hmm. as they are supposed to be if they are not then the CSO will tell us that something is happening somewhere and you as in the ministry should be held accountable as to what is uh, happening too so we are doing uh, much that we are supposed, supposed to, do, to do but mm -hmm. there are still some gaps which we are hoping in the near future uh, that maybe we may be able to, uh, to overcome all of these things that are happening, that our children in the Gambia mm. will be safe and free from all this type of violence that they are undergoing. Thank you very much, Harriet Buzz, uh, the child care officer. Well, of course, you no know, people tax with caring for children. Mm -hmm. You know, we can sit here and have a banter for the whole day talking about the issue of children. They're so passionate mm -hmm. uh, about the work that they do. They're from the Ministry of uh, Gender, uh, Children and Social Welfare. Aisa Tuba, uh, thank you so very much for coming. And Mr. Sajo Kamara from the Ministry of Health. Uh, I can say the busiest ministry over these uh, two years in this country. Uh, but uh, kudos to the good job that you're doing. Well, beautiful viewers. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this uh, special edition of uh, COVID-19 sensitization and uh, child protection related issues. I've been your host, Babu Karsi. I hope we'll come back here uh, another time. I, I have to ask this. I hope you will not do one program on any day. 
No, no, no. We, we'll, we'll continue. Have a series of Thank you. And Bob can see <laughs> our office is at our ministry. Mm. It's at uh, Fatu Golden pa Plaza, Plaza. Okay. just adjacent to the election house. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, mm -hmm. Batting Harding Highway. Highway. That's mm -hmm. where our ministry is located. P perfect. Thank you so much, viewers. That's all we have time for the, uh, this special edition uh, of, of this uh, important program, which is to talk about the children's uh, protection you know, in this uh, COVID 19 pandemic. Till we come your way next time. Uh, thanks for watching and continue viewing our unbeatable programs. Bye for now. <laughs>